There's a hand at the back. A hand at the back, great, please. There we go. Thank you, Minister. Good evening. Um, I would have loved to hear your reflections on the recent selection of the head of the World Bank. The process, has it changed? Do we move towards more ac transparency, more accountability? And how would be the process five years from now on? Look, let me, let me start off by saying that uh, I don't know uh, the nominee, I don't know Dr. Kim. Um, but I think at, at one level he's a very exciting prospect. Uh, but uh, uh, for me it was a rabbit out of the hat. Uh, and when I first saw the announcement, the pictures that they had of Dr. Kim was wearing a hat and rapping with his students. It was a wonderful picture. Um, it endeared him to me. The one thing that I think was different about this process is that there were interviews for the very, very first time. Now, the problem that we haven't resolved is that uh, people would vote on the basis of persuasion. Now, I've, I've indicated earlier that uh, Dr. Ngozi Konje Iweila is a friend and we've worked together for many years. But here you have a candidate who has an established track record, academically no flies on her, established track record in the bank, is called by President Obasanjo to be the finance minister to turn around uh, the situation in Nigeria does that, there's a change of government, uh, she's then called back into the World Bank and she then has uh, 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 a view of the operations of the World Bank from a much higher level and then she's called back into Nigeria and she gets her hands dirty in, in dealing with the day-to-day nitty-gritty of, of transforming a country. Now, pound for pound, I mean, I, I think that the track record speaks for itself. The question is whether the EDs, when they sit down to take these decisions, are free to take decisions or whether they see country flags. Because it didn't ever get to the point where the US had to remind anybody of its veto in decision making. And that is a problem, and I think the problem vests still in the governance of the bank and the fund. You know, a few years ago, I was asked to chair a committee to look at governance of the, 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 the fund, and uh, uh, on a similar track, uh, Ernesto Zedillo uh, was, was doing something in the bank. Um, and the EDs who have the power vested in them basically sent us back to the drawing board because they wouldn't have their own power uh, reduced in any way. Uh, so you don't, you don't have change. You've done a lot of work in these areas and you don't have change. And so you sit with something that is moderately different because at least you've had interviews for the first time, but it hasn't changed at all. And that, I think, is the problem. Question is, I mean, it, it arose before Bob Zulik was appointed. Um, it arose at the time that that Jim Wolfenson stepped down, it was very strongly in, in, in focus. Paul Wolfowitz came along, uh, and then Bob Zillick, and by the time Bob Zillick came, everybody was quiet. But the same thing happened across the road. It happened when, when, when Horst Kohler was, was, was asked to go back to, to Germany. In fact, it happened at the point of Horst's appointment because there was an alternative from Germany even. Uh, so it hasn't changed, and I think it still is a, a fundamental problem because right now my view would be that the world needs to hear some rational leadership from the bank and fund, and it's actually missing in action. Uh, uh, the problem is Europe, and the IMF is not capable of speaking on Europe right now. Uh,
let, let, me, let me tell you, uh, let me start with an anecdote. A few years ago in Ghana, they, they raised uh, the need for, many years Ghana had raised the need for uh, a hydroelectric uh, scheme on the Volta River. And every year Ghana was up against its borrowing limits at the World Bank and the ADB being part of the same system, the African Development Bank that is, uh, was, was not in a position to lend to Ghana. And so Ghana couldn't expand its industrial base because it didn't have the energy. And along comes China and they offer Ghana uh, the opportunity to construct the hydroelectric scheme. And Ghana agreed to it. Uh, that was before oil was discovered in Ghana, but it placed that country in a very strong position. Now, part of, part of what you need to do in development is not just allow the accountants to look at it. Our development paradigm needs to take account of a whole range of different issues. And I think that that's what you've seen in the, the anecdote I shared with you. And I'm hoping that, I mean, look, I, I don't belong to a school of thought that says that all uh, uh, economic norms uh, relating to the ability to repay would be thrown out the window. But I do think that we need to think differently. The Chiang Mai initiative, putting money on the table, has actually created enormous challenges in the way in which the IMF thinks about reserves and the way in which you can uh, put together a war chest to support countries in, in distress. And I think that the idea of the BRICS development institution uh, should, be in a, a, should, should, should place us in a similar position because if you've never tested the waters, then I think we'll all be constrained by the norms that were applicable 60 years ago. Uh, so, you know, we have, to, we have to ask that there be transparency, clear rules. But, but to focus on the development imperative. There was a hand, yeah? Thank you for this very speech. Um, when you hear about the acronym BRICS in your South Africa, in it, it makes you optimistic, it makes you worried, or it makes you pessimistic? I mean, part of, part of the, 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 the craziness of what we're talking about as BRICS is you have one man sitting in a merchant bank uh, in the asset management side of the merchant bank, he, he, he takes his view of the world and suddenly we have to align with that. So let me, let me talk out of school. You know, we, we had a few initiatives. We, there was the, I think it was called the G, G8 plus 5. Uh, and so when the G8 met, uh, they'd invite a few other heads of state and so it would be Mexico, Brazil, India, China, uh, South Africa. And then the five would meet. So the G7, the G7 meets. And then they invite Russia. Uh, and then they issue a statement after the G7 has met. And we decided that we should meet as well. And then uh, uh, we'd meet. And uh, then the BRIC, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China would meet. and put South Africa out of the room. And uh, 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 our problem was that all of this was, was something designed uh, uh, not, not on, on geographic advantage or anything, but, but sitting, sitting in the office uh, uh, of, a, of, of an investment bank, it didn't seem to make sense to us. And then India, Brazil, and South Africa would meet as IPSA. Right, so they would then have to put out Russia and China and then the three of us meet. Now, uh, uh, it, seems, it seems like lunacy, but this is the stuff we've been doing. I think what we need is a rational uh, uh, kind of alignment. Accept that the G7 is, is passé, though I would imagine that yesterday the G7 heads of state met uh, just so that the G20 didn't get any ideas about anything. <laughs> um, and um, you've got the G20, but the G20 was decided on in a particular way. And the way in which it was decided upon was countries that were deemed to be systemically significant to the financial 
system. And that's not the same as, as countries of geopolitical strength. Uh, you'll never find a perfect uh, uh, balance, but, but I think that we must be open to ideas. Right now, uh, a number of different African countries would be invited in for those discussions. And for some reason, certainly when Zapatero was still a prime minister in Spain, Spain would be there as well. Uh, I don't know what the new alignment looks like, and I don't know who's gathered uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Mexico now. But it's clear that we, we need to find some kind of balance, some kind of structure that uh, allows a few countries to talk through issues and agree. Perhaps one last one. OK. Uh, no, that, that's going to be the second last one, because le let me tell you why it's the second last one. You see, we, we have our constitution in South Africa is founded on certain provisions, and, and those provisions include a commitment to non-racism and non-sexism. <laughs> so gender representativity in everything we do is fundamentally important. I don't want to be foul of our constitution, so I'll allow for that one. And Dave, you, you will forgive me, but the next question has to be from a woman. It's just a... <laughs> what you just said about G20. Here, um, the uh, think tank initiative has assembled a cross-section of think tanks from around the world, uh, and they represent countries that are part of G20. What should be some of the leading items on the agenda that these think tanks should be working on if they are to work on G20 issues? That is the only show that's sort of in town that has some meaning. What are the ways in which us people as think tanks can influence that agenda? I think one of the first issues is, is recognize that, that the global imbalances will remain a problem going forward. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with uh, countries with surplus savings, uh, surplus trade, uh, surpluses on the balance uh, of payments, and the deficit countries, and how do you how do you uh, structure this going forward? That's one set of issues, but all of that deals with, with, with the macroeconomic uh, 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 challenges. There isn't talk about microeconomics. And, and the biggest challenges that confront us right now are in the microeconomic arena. And I, I fervently believe that uh, the Think Tank Initiative should be able to spawn some processes that allows us to understand that differently. And within that framework, I think that uh, the world would be a much better place if we weren't shy about talking about the elements of social solidarity. And all of the key social programs belong under that sphere, but they must be affordable. Uh, and so we have to continue to push the boundaries and ensure that we can deal with it. Um, and as we exchange more information about these issues, I think we will be better off. I mean, I sat in a, a forum not too long ago where the former Greek prime, I was sitting between the former Greek prime minister and the former speaker of, uh, I think it's Estonia. And basically, this guy said, Greece must get out. You are too wealthy, there's too much solidarity, uh, and we want a different outlook on the world. I think that, that, that in, the, in, in, the, in the constancy of pressure, we're actually allowing what should inform the interrelationship between governments and peoples. And I'd like to believe that, that solidarity ought to be one of those, those values that we actually never relent on. Okay. Thank you. Um, throughout the day, we've been discussing how to reach out to policymakers today. And um, in your, um, what would you recommend? Three most important methods to reach out to policymakers uh, for the think tanks. I think, you know, l let me be rude because. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that think tanks tend to talk to themselves too often. <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I was told that, that, that there are no South African think tanks here um, because they are too strong or something like that. <laughs> I've been a minister in, in, in government for just over 18 years. And I have never had a South African think tank come to me with a set of proposals that they uh, think that we should focus on drawing attention to issues that we, we, we should consider doing differently. And so what we have in the absence of that uh, is, is, is fairly loud. Uh, you know, we, 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 we we, we've, we have a patent on something called the Vuvuzela. <laughs> it's a loud horn. You saw it in the World Cup two years ago. It's terrible. It, it just creates a cacophony. You can't hear anything. And so we think that, that it's possible to replace rational discussions on policy by, by a Vuvuzela. It doesn't work. <laughs> so, so I think that, that policymakers need to step up. Uh, think tanks need to be heard. Think tanks need to ensure that we as policymakers have fewer places to hide away from you. Uh, and, and the only way you can do it is actually to pepper us. And, and let me say that there are some think tanks I'm familiar with. The reason I picked out Nancy earlier because, you know, every day there's something from them that pops up on my, 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 my screen. Uh, it works. It really, really works. Uh, and so you've got to find the ways and means of ensuring that, that you can develop the norms and standards and people can actually begin to, to feel uh, what the alternatives are because the idea that once you get into government you have all of the answers or that the only stream of information comes from these very smart or pretensively smart uh, civil servants is patently wrong. The more ideas we have, I think the better the quality of policy making going forward. Thank you.